It is now my great honor to introduce to you Amelia Earhart Fellow, Naoko Yamazaki. Naoko is a former Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut and only the second Japanese woman to qualify as an astronaut. She was named an international honorary member of Zant International in 2012. I will now invite Naoko to tell us more about herself and her career since receiving the Amelia Earhart Fellowship in 1994. Naoko, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies, and thank you, Holly and President Sonia, and all the committee members of this Zonter International Convention, uh, especially uh, Sadako Miyake-san and each members, I'd like to express my great gratitude. Well, this is my great privilege to join you in this convention and to meet each representative from various countries. As Holly introduced, uh, I received my uh, Maria Earhart Scholarship back in 1994, and which changed my career. I received not only financial support, but also great inspiration from the Zonter International members. Because through the networking meetings, I met many women in the aerospace. And one of the ladies was sitting next to me in this picture, and she was a helicopter pilot. And when I met her, she was already over 70 years old. But she said, you know, she was still enjoying flying helicopters, and I was so amazed, you know. Oh, so challenging, you know, their own lives. It would be so much fun. So I got a great inspiration. So uh, let me go back to why I got a desire to study abroad and to study aerospace engineering. It is because when I was a ch ch child in Japan, actually I was born in Chiba Prefecture, well, you know, I thought the space programs were only in science fiction movies. And actually I got inspiration from Star Wars and so on. <laughs> well, but I realized, you know, there are many engineers and researchers and even astronauts who are working towards space programs eventually. And when I was a junior high school student, I had a pimple in the United States. And she lived in Ohio, and I enjoyed, you know, so much exchanging postcards and pictures and letters. So those experiences made me interested in studying in the abroad someday. And also, when I was a junior high school student in back in the 80s, international space station program started. In Japan, decided to join it. So. The first Japanese astronauts, Dr. Mori Mamoru and Chiaki Mukai and Takao Doi were selected. I was very surprised to see them. Wow, the Japanese would go to space some days. And I decided to study aerospace and would love to go to space someday. So that's why, you know, I enjoyed learning about the aerospace engineering. And as I learned more, you know, I, the more desire I got to study abroad because the aerospace is kind of international cooperation so that I wanted to learn about many countries as well. So fortunately, the Amelia Earhart Fellowship connected all the desires to study abroad and also to study aerospace. So without this scholarship program, I would not have been able to, you know, pursue my career in aerospace. So I really, really appreciate your activities and I'm proud of you, your activities. Thank you so much. Well, 
So as I told you before, I got an inspiration from uh, the lady of a helicopter pilot. I decided to apply for an astronaut selection program. But when I tried first time, I couldn't make it. I failed. So I started working as an engineer. And then on my second trial, I made it. So after you know, I joined in astronaut corps, I asked first. I asked with several colleagues in NASA, and they said, "Well, I made it on my fifth trial or on my sixth trial, <laughs> right?" So endurance is the key to continue our career. What I learned, well. So how should I keep the endurance, or should I keep motivation? I think it will. The key point is to enjoy what we are doing, enjoy the activities. Of course, the training is a long way. Actually, I trained for 11 years before going into space. Even after selected as an astronaut, so it's a long way, and sometimes. It gets difficult to keep motivation, but enjoying what you're doing is the key to, you know, keep learning and keep motivation. I think, and Japan doesn't have its own manned spacecraft yet, so all the training will happen in mainly United States, Russia, or Germany or Canada. And so on. So I have kept traveling a lot during my training era. So actually, I didn't know where I would be and what I'd be doing in my training era in three months. I had no prediction. But I was had a great pleasure to meet many people in each country. And after the three years when I started my training. The space shuttle Columbia accident happened, <laughs> and we lost seven colleagues in space shuttle Columbia. It was a sad moment, and the space shuttle couldn't fly almost for three years after the accident, of course. And the program, space station program, stopped in the middle. So everybody got in worried and got uncertain error. But when you know, we had. Uncertainty. There is no concrete answer. So I remember this poem very often. This is a serenity prayer, and you know, please, you know, give serenity to accept things I cannot change, and the courage to change what I can, and also the wisdom to distinguish these two. So this is a simple poem, but this. Gave me a lot of power to continue my training. So you know, I cannot change, of course, nature or weather or those kind of situation by myself. But in any situation, there is something what I can do, right? So in my case, you know, during this era, I visited Russia and continue another spacecraft training. And all the space shuttle couldn't fly either, but still, you know, we started new training in the U.S. So those kind of things, you know, continued even in a hard time. And then finally, after 11 years, I got appointed on the space shuttle mission STS-131. So this is a group picture of our, you know, crew members and the <laughs> gentleman. Thank you so much. In the picture right here. He was the commander Poindexter, and he looked like Bruce Willis, Hollywood movie star. Don't you think so? So this picture is after the movie <laughs> Armageddon. <laughs> this is an official picture of NASA. So for each mission, we got to see, and then took off. So you know, it was very surprisingly quick to reach space after the launch. It took only eight minutes and thirty seconds to get to space. It was so quick, comparing to the time error of the training of eleven years. <laughs> so the destination was the International Space Station. So fifteen nations involved in this 
project, and it's still operating probably until 2024. This is a group picture on board. And I was in the left side right here, and there is another Japanese, Noguchi Soichi, hanging from the ceiling like a bat in a black shirt. So in microgravity, you can take any posture as you like, and it's no problem. So which means each people has its own, his or her own up and down. So when you make a conversation, we have to be very careful because just up and down doesn't mean anything because they have different up and downs. So we have to say, look, you're up, or look, you're down. Otherwise, we cannot communicate. So on the ground, of course, we have to take care of each other, each position. So that's true in space as well. And during this mission, we had the record to have four women at the same time in space. It was the first record, so I'm very honored to be on this mission. And of course, on the ground, there is a huge supporting team. And actually, without them, it couldn't be success, the, our mission. So, in the launch pad, we had a banner which said, we are behind you, discovery. And this is not a dirt. They are the signatures of you know, each employee or you know, neighbors or friends or families. So the team doesn't it sell it was all, not only the employees, but the team include neighbors, community, and also the families. So you know, we, I'm so proud of to have such a big team and to be a part of such a big team. And after 15 days of the mission, this is a picture of the just after the landing. What I was surprised most is the heaviness of gravity. You know, after spending 15 days in microgravity, the gravity felt so heavy. Even a piece of paper felt so heavy. Even a pencil felt so heavy. So, which was very surprising. And also, at the same time, when I walked outside, there was a breeze, nice breeze, and also the smells of greens. Those kind of nature felt, you know, made, made me feel so comfortable. And I felt so, you know, thankful to all the natural natures and everything, which I thought very natural before. So I really appreciate. And usually we say when you go to a different town or you go to a different country, then you can learn about your hometown more. I felt exactly the same. When I visited space, then returned to the Earth, and now I learned much more about our home planet, the Earth. So now I am having a new you know, path, new career right now. And I am a chairman of the Sorajo, which is Women in Aerospace in Japan, because I got inspiration from Maria Earhart Fellowship and those kind of networking. I would love to, you know, to pass those bonds to the next generation. So that's why I'm involved in these activities right now. And also, uh, right now, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe promotes women in STEM careers. So I became an ambassador. Also, I was supporting the space education, like these cancer programs for high school students, younger generations. And also, I'm supporting the space culture. It's a, you know, planting cherry blossom trees in the area of Tohoku, which, you know, uh, damaged from the big earthquake back in 2011. And also, uh, I am joining in the Space Policy Committee right now because uh, space policy is greatly related to this sustainable development of the United Nations. And including, you know, education or the gender equality and climate action and so on. So, because, you know, in, 
International Space Station, we are working sustainable society, otherwise we couldn't survive. And which one is already recycled? Do you have any idea? For the first one, water is already recycled. So which means we drink reused water corrected from the toilet or washing <laughs> machine and then purify it and drink it. That's normal in space. And the air is also recycled in space. We absorb carbon dioxide and then during by a chemical reaction we generate oxygen. But the clothes cannot be recycled yet. We cannot wash our clothes in space. We cannot use so much water in space. So we keep wearing the same clothes for about a couple of days, and once it gets dirt, then we can throw it away. So we need more improvement. And electric power is managed and self-sufficient in space using the solar panels and batteries. And the food, we have to rely on the supply from the ground. But now we are working on a space agriculture to be more self-sufficient on food. And we grow lettuce, soybeans, sulfur, and actually we harvest them and eat them. So those kind of improvement is necessary in space. And also we can share those technologies on the ground as well. And after 2024, we are aiming the further exploration to the moon and to Mars. And this kind of new program, we have more nations involved. So I'm so pleased to see it. Those kind of cooperation is getting wider and wider, which I love it. And here's a picture of the Earth taken from the satellite. It's blue and watery and beautiful. But if we collect all the water of the ocean, lakes, and glaciers, it is only this amount comparing to the Earth. So even on the Earth, water is precious. And the Earth itself is like a spaceship from this picture. And actually, if we see the solar systems, uh, the Jupiter's Saturn uh, Ganymede has more water than the Earth, or Titan Saturn, uh, the Saturn satellite Titan has more water than the Earth. So I hope eventually we visit more and we spread to the solar system and utilizing those kind of water. So those, that's why uh, we are expanding our frontiers into space. And here's a picture of the International Space Station at the time of sunrise. The Earth is upper half, it's still dark, and the space is dark, but reflecting the sunrise, the layer of atmosphere is lit in rainbow, it's beautiful, but I was also supplied with this thinness of the layer of atmosphere. So we are protected by this thin layer, like this. And this is a picture of the daylight. In the daytime, uh, the blue ocean and white clouds are so colorful and dynamic. And close to the poles, the northern lights, auroras are so beautiful at night as well. So I could feel the power of nature, wild nature. But at the same time, at night, we could see these city lights. It's so bright. So I could feel the power of human beings as well. We have strong power as well. And here's a picture of Apollo era of the Earth taken from the moon. And the Earth is actually looks like a starship. And here is a crescent moon and the crescent Earth. I don't know what to call this one, but the moon and the Earth, it's in the same picture. It is a rare picture because if you want to take this one, you have to go farther. Actually, this one was taken by a Mars exploration vehicle on the way to Mars. 
And if you're going to go to Mars, it takes at least six months. And if you want to make a round trip, it takes years. So no one has seen it, this scenery with their bare own eyes. But I hope someday, in a couple of decades, somebody will be able to see this scenery. And this is our galaxy. We are here. And so considering this space, the universe, it's so wide. That's why it is interesting. This is my favorite word. Wonderful comes from full of wonder, full of unknowns. So space is still filled with unknown. And it's the same for our lives. You know, we cannot predict our lives in the future. So that's why sometimes we get worried. Me too. But this means, you know, our paths, it's not fixed. It can be changed if we make an action, if we collaborate, we can make the path change for the good direction. So again, I'm so proud of your activities and this is my great privilege to, to join you in the Jonta International Convention. I wish each of you a great success and great happiness in your life. Thank you so much.